I'm Alan Frunzlers with the Agricultural Research Service of USDA. I'm going to present the module on silvopasture management. This is one of seven modules offered in this webinar series. In this presentation, we'll talk about silvopasture management. If you are interested in the other resources offered by North Carolina Choices, you can find out more on our website or on YouTube channel. So this presentation was prepared by Josh Adasi, a consultant on forest management, Mr. Brian Parrish, a Harnett County Extension agent, Mr. Colby Lambert, a Harnett County Extension agent in forestry, and Mr. Bjorn Lanier, who is a private landowner who owns Piney Woods Farm, and myself with the USDA Agriculture Research Service. Silvopasture is the combination of trees, forages, and livestock integrated into a working system on a farm. Silvopasture is, is, is an agroforestry practice that is specifically designed and managed for production of trees, tree products, forage, and livestock. Silvopasture can be uh, taken from an angle of uh, forage crops deliberately introduced into uh, a timber production system to enhance that timber production system, or it can be from an angle of, of timber crops deliberately introduced or enhanced in a forage production system. So there are two ways that, that uh, silvopasture are, are usually adopted. One where there's a, a timber manager that's wanting to add value with, with the livestock, and the other is with the livestock manager that wants to add trees for added income and or comfort of the animals. So why, why adopt silvopasture? Well, there's an uh, opportunity to diversify on-farm income. One can increase biological diversity with the different range of, of animals, plants, uh, species that are on the land. Certainly one can improve forage quality because the uh, opportunity for better forage quality with uh, shading, uh, preservation of moisture uh, near trees. One could uh, provide wildlife habitat through the, in, uh, the implementation of trees on the landscape on, in an otherwise uh, pastured landscape. And certainly the trees provide shade for livestock, which is an important aspect here in the southeastern U.S. There's increased uh, access for salvage of, of timber, so this is an idea that if, if uh, timber were, were to fail or to, uh, to have a disease outbreak, one has easy access to, get, to be able to, to salvage those operations uh, because there's, there are lanes of, of forage there. There's also a, a reduced uh, wildfire risk because one is managing the understory and not allowing uh, a lot of uh, uh, burn potential understory. There's a possibility of controlling insects better in the timber. And there's a minimized risk of low pulp market prices because one is getting an, uh, uh, an income from alternative sources. And certainly there is an opportunity to boost the recreational activities on the farm because there's uh, simply silver pastures are, are more beautiful landscape than, than most other single-use landscapes. So the benefits of silver pasture are to protect water quality. Certainly one can reduce soil erosion because there's better uh, uh, control of erosion because of the soil is, is more stable with the, uh, the tree roots and the grass roots. It improves water holding capacity of soil. One can improve nutrient cycling because trees are not typically uh, ne needed to be fertilized, but they can have access to the nutrients that are supplied to the pasture. And those nutrients that are, are then effectively cycled through the foliage and, and, uh, and decomposition in the soil. So there's an opportunity to increase uh, tree growth rate. Uh, certainly there's more opportunity for leaf area index in, in, the, in an open tree environment, and so trees often grow faster. It improves animal performance because of the shading effect and the control of the weather conditions, even in the wintertime, uh, controlling some of the wind. And reduce uh, forest fuel load uh, to reduce fire. There's an increased biological diversity, uh, certainly in many bird species and, and uh, deer and other uh, animals are prevalent on, on mixed-use landscapes. And certainly there's, there's uh, aesthetics and that, that, that it increases the property value of, of, the, of the location. There's an increased cash flow that is possible with trees growing because of, of the more diversified and distributed income potential. And we believe that it's, it's more a sustainable approach because there are le fewer chemicals that are needed and uh, less uh, mechanical control in, in establishing tree stands. The benefits of silver pasture to livestock production include, the, the, of course, the, the shade that uh, extends the grazing season, not only during the season because of the better forage uh, 
uh, duration. One, one pres preserves forage because of uh, better water relations, better um, utilization of, of sunlight and, and shading. But also even during the day in that uh, the animals are often uh, able to, to rest uh, uh, without feeling heat stress and they, they graze during the, the middle of the day as well because they always have this access to shade when they, when they need it. So it improves the animal comfort or the gain in summer. Uh, there are some estimates that it increases feed efficiency by 20%, uh, that the shelter from high winds can, can provide a 70% increase in, in productivity, uh, shelter from snow, uh, is there is some estimate there, and shelter from rain. So the, these are uh, weather op observations that are important for animals, that it provides more of a protective habitat, almost uh, like uh, providing a, a housing situation, an outdoor housing. And there's the opportunity to stockpile forage, but uh, that's, that's something that uh, any producer can do when, when they have the opportunity. But uh, it gives an opportunity within the tree landscape. So the income opportunities with silver pasture are that you can have a diversified livestock arrangement. Uh, this, this is suitable for cattle, for, for goats, for sheep, for hogs, poultry. There's the opportunity for grazing and haying of forages. And certainly any pasture ma manager knows that you, one can graze or hay, but, but there is the opportunity to, to more control that. So you have the opportunity for wood products, for fruits, if, if, if you have plant the right trees, uh, berries. Uh, there's the hot wildlife habitat, and if you're in an environment where you could op have an opportunity to lease out hunting, this is a possibility. The next step is, is to, well, how do we actually find out, how do we establish a silver pasture? Well, there are the many, several options, and some of the most common are that uh, we can plant trees into an existing pasture where there's a, typically it would be most ideal in the beginning to have a hay land so that there are not animals grazing on the trees. Otherwise, you have an increased cost of fencing. But one can also consider that, uh, like we've done at uh, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems in Goldsboro, is planting trees into cropland and converting that cropland into a pasture. So the fact that uh, we had a cropland, we, we planted uh, the trees, allowed them to develop, and then uh, planted a pasture leads to uh, a situation where we can have an established silver pasture. And the final option is, is probably the most common, and because uh, there, we are in an environment where there are many timber lands, and those timber uh, parcels can be thinned and uh, forages can be established underneath. The key is to, to make sure that you have enough sunlight entering the, the, the system to accommodate the forages that, are, that you're planting. So the components of a silver pasture system are that you have trees, forage crops, and livestock. And they're, they're, the idea is that, so that, that they work together uh, rather than competing against each other. Uh, the tree component, uh, one has to determine what the right tree is for the landscape. Uh, that, that can be determined by what, uh, you, what you want to do with the timber, how you want to sell it. You can um, grow trees for high quality timber for, for saw, saw logs, or you can have pulp wood. And th those are certainly options, and that determines maybe what the species is. So you uh, have an opportunity for rapid growth uh, because of, of a silver pasture with a more open, open growth habit. Uh, there are, of course, deep roots with the trees. Uh, there's the issue of, of whether they're drought tolerant or not. Uh, there's production of additional products such as nuts or fodder, and that can be uh, for the livestock on the, on the grazed pasture. There, there are possibilities of, of uh, including trees that the animals can consume, the, uh, the nuts or the, or the byproducts of the, the fallen fruits of the, of the trees that the animals can consume. It's, it's maybe not a, a, an essential part of the, the grazing system, but it's, it's something that could be considered. And how you want to design the, the, the tree, the landscape for, with the environment in mind. So the types of trees can be uh, typically here in the southeast would be loblolly pine or slash pine, longleaf pine, shortleaf pine. Uh, ponderosa pine is, is uh, more prevalent in the west and Douglas fir as well. And there are many hardwoods that can be considered. Oftentimes, producers are, are not maybe interested in the, in the hardwoods because they do take a little bit longer, but uh, the value of them is often much greater if, if going for um, saw timber. So we're going to talk about the main species that are in a silver pasture in the southeastern United States, and the, the primary one is, is loblolly pine. It's a very fast-growing species. It's very versatile. It's, it's uh, adaptable to a range of site conditions. 
It's the most commonly planted pine species. It is native to the region, but it is the most commonly planted pine species. Uh, there are improved varieties available to reduce the rotation length. Um, as I'm told that uh, rotation can be down to 30, 35 years uh, in, in some sites. And there are a fusiform rust resistant varieties that should be considered because this can be quite devastating to the stand. You can uh, thin for pulp wood uh, from, a, uh, from a solid stand. You can thin to pulp wood in 12 to 15 years or, or thin your, even your, your alleys, the, the, tr the trees with them in there. And that's a good way to create a saw timber that is, uh, has more space for it. But you can have the, the chip and saw timber in 22 to 35 years if in, in these improved species uh, varieties of loblolly. Certainly one can fertilize loblolly, but, uh, and, and there's no real need to fertilize it, but the, the one can fertilize, and if there is a source of broiler litter, it can certainly rapidly increase growth rate early on in the, in the cycle. There's the, uh, the condition of more branches, more shade within uh, an agroforestry type planting of loblolly. Uh, the, the tree species does adapt to the open environment. It'll create more branches, and so there may be more pruning that's required for that. And typically, trees should be about five to eight years old before exposing them to grazing livestock because the, the livestock are, are curious animals. They're going to rub up against the trees, they're, they're, and you don't want to ruin your investment by having the livestock to, uh, uh, kill, the, to kill the trees because they'll rub the bark off of them. The ge geographical range of loblolly pine is quite extensive. It's throughout the whole southeastern U.S. Uh, it's in, it was throughout the, all of the coastal plain and into the Piedmont is, is its normal habitat, and certainly it, it grows very well throughout most of uh, the eastern half of North Carolina. Another key species is longleaf pine. It's, a, it's also a native uh, pine species to the, to the region. It produces high-quality timber. It uh, is, is long-lived, and it, uh, it's, it's maybe why we don't have uh, as many anymore, in that it uh, does tend to live longer and it takes a longer time for, to, for one to harvest that, that species. At one time it covered two-thirds of the, of the region of the southeast. It's also adaptable to a wide variety of soils, although I would say that it's less adaptable to the, to the wetter soils. So it's uh, more suited to dry and infertile sites. And uh, we've had experience ourselves that uh, it does not adapt very well to flooded or uh, heavy, heavy saturated uh, soils which typically have more clay co uh, content on them. And it's typically grown in a longer rotation, so it, it's that longer species, longer lived species that uh, takes more time to develop. And because it's, it is, makes a great pole, uh, it is, is great saw timber to, to, to harvest. It may be more difficult to establish than loblolly pine, and uh, I say that because the people have had experiences. It has a grass stage initially, and so oftentimes it's more difficult to keep the weeds under control, and so it takes a little bit longer to establish, but once it is established, it, it, it grows very well in our region. Uh, people have proposed that burning and herbicides can be um, one way to help get uh, trees to maturity faster. And there's an opportunity to, to cut for chip and saw timber at 30 to 45 years, but uh, the, the species will grow for 100 years, certainly. There's also an opportunity to, to add value by uh, raking paint, pine straw. Certainly one could do that, and uh, there, depending on the, on the stand density, it, you, you may want to limit how much you do that, because the, the, that straw is important for the, the tree survival, but it, there is a copious amount of straw that is produced and one could, could harvest that. And the species doesn't respond really dramatically to fertilization, so be careful to not apply too much fertilizer. The soils of the region, of, uh, which are typically 5 to 5.5, 5, uh, are, are ideal for it, and so trying to maintain that would, would be good. And if there is a site that is uh, below 5, pH 5, then it may be appropriate to add lime, but it, it can tolerate some some good acidity as well. It's got a, a large geographical range like the loblolly. The, the lob, long leaf is, is uh, well adapted to the region. And so again, it's in the eastern half of, the, of North Carolina. Hardwoods are another option. Uh, they are a high quality timber, uh, furniture making for, for, for fence posts, all kinds of different things. Hardwoods are, 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 tend to have a, a reputation of growing slower. 
So they're suitable when planting fescue and other cool season grasses because the, of, the, of the winter season in that the leaves are falling down and that there's more light penetrating when cool season grasses can be, can, can be uh, growing more when, when that more sunlight comes into the, uh, through the canopy. So deep shade may not support warm season grasses. Uh, we do have an experiment where the, we do have the hardwoods along with uh, some warm season grasses, and certainly warm season grasses are inhibited by uh, so too, too much shade. There's good results when thinning mature stands. Uh, so you, this is a, an option when you, one has a solid stand of timber and that uh, one can actually thin the, the, those uh, mature stands and you can still plant uh, forages under mature stands of hardwoods. There may be a high cost of that site preparation when one does have a uh, mature stand and trying to get the grass established. The stumps are typically resistant to rot, so mechanical removal may be, may, may be needed, but it depends on the, on the type of uh, location and the operation because the, the, um, it does, it's not always necessary to, to disturb the soil, to till the soil, to drill the, the seed in because one has options to broadcast and allow the, the animals to graze around uh, stumps. But, but they, the, those stumps uh, will limit any kind of mechanical traffic out, out there. So site pre preparation for tree planting, say, into, a, a, into an agricultural field, either grass or cropland, is that one, one has to prepare the, air, the line of trees. And, and this is important because you want to get the tree off to a good start. So there are options of disking or subsoiling. Uh, this, this tool on the right is, is a scalper. Uh, then one could simply uh, apply herbicides or apply some sort of mulch, but uh, there's, there are other options of simply drilling auger holes and planting trees that way as well. But uh, the issue of weed control can be serious, but uh, it depends on your operation. If, if it's a very intensive operation, then one can do a lot of hand uh, control. But if it's a very extensive, then you, you want to choose more options that are, that are maybe more herbicide related. So the choice depends on labor available, the cost allocation, the site conditions, and desired impact on loosening soil for root growth and development. In general, the, 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 uh, the better conditions you give the tree in the beginning, the, the better off it'll be later on. So improving that condition early on is important. It'll be hard to improve that condition later on. You can consider uh, mulching. This is a good, uh, good way of both fertilizing and controlling weeds because uh, mulch is going to decompose and, it, and it's going to provide the, the, the tree with uh, more water and, and better establishment conditions during the first couple of years. So for weed, ma weed management, certainly uh, herbicides are often recommended for a good survival because the, the growth, can be quite, uh, growth of weeds can be quite extensive. And so that might be a, an approach that one has to consider that uh, maybe you don't want to necessarily disturb the soil very much. If one has a, a, a perennial grass already established, maybe minimizing its growth but not killing it completely is, 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 is a, um, maybe a better approach because weeds can over, overgrow the trees themselves. So the annual weeds often grow six to eight foot tall, those species that are out there. And so they can, they can really shade out the trees. There's also this possibility of banded or spot spraying herbicides along the tree rows, and that, that can be really effective, uh, that, that one minimizes the amount of, of disturbance that, that's out there. And there are a number of, of uh, herbicides that are labeled for uh, weed, weed and grass control in, uh, in these tree uh, operations, and uh, these are changing all the time, so it's best to, to uh, ex check your, with your local extension service. Uh, with any kind of herbicide, one has to be careful about drift and the compat compatibility of that herbicide with whatever crops or, or plants that are in the neighborhood. So uh, please uh, try, to, try to minimize the drift. One option for, for establishing trees in agricultural land is, is really a good one, is, is, uh, is to try to, to manage the forage initially by mechanical means. Uh, because the, those animals will have to be uh, uh, separated from those trees because the animals will damage the trees. They often they'll, they'll uh, browse on the trees, and so they're, they're damaging the, the shoots, but they're, they're, they're also rub against them. So mowing or, or haying will be, will be a good option to um, control the, 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 the biomass in between the trees. 
And uh, so the haying uh, allows uh, an operator to gain income from that land uh, in the interim when, when there's good investment on the, on the trees already. As far as tree spacing, there are a lot of different options, and these, these are some observations that uh, my colleagues have made. And I don't think there is any one solution, but uh, certainly you're going to have to consider that you're not going to have as many trees on the landscape as a traditional forest. So oftentimes uh, one starts with three to 400 trees per acre. That's a number that one can consider as, as, a, as a starting point. But then the, the idea would be that uh, once those trees are uh, at a certain level, you are allowed to then pick those trees that you want to remain. And you want to pick those that are the best, they're the straightest, uh, if you're looking for saw timber, or, or that are growing the best uh, for, 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 uh, chip, for chipping or, or for pulp. But eventually you're going to thin to 50 to 150 trees per acre. So that's that's uh, kind of the target range. Uh, they, the, the Mr. Lanier, who uh, operates Piney Woods Farm, he's targeting 80 trees per acre at final thin. And these are going to be for, for uh, saw timber, and they're, they allow enough light to penetrate for the forage to, to, for the livestock, and he's going to be able to harvest those trees uh, for maturity. So some of the tree arrangements, uh, oftentimes uh, we think of rows and alleys, that uh, we have forage in, in, in these alleys and we have rows of trees. So in, the, in that case, you're going to have to consider the equipment size, not only now, but also in the future of what you think you're going to have on your, on your operation. Because minimizing the uh, number of passes over the land is always important. Uh, you're going to consider the forage species and whether you're going to have a grazing or, or a haying operation and consider the trees in, in, uh, the, as, as they develop over time. And so they, the trees, uh, the, uh, during the first few years, they're going to look like a minor component, but all of a sudden, in 10 years, they, all of the, the landscape is going to look like more like a forest and with a, uh, less like a, a grazing land. So you're going to have to th consider your thinning and pruning management. Uh, certainly, rows of, tr of trees are, uh, make it easier for a labor force to work through and, and simply uh, thin and prune the, tr the trees in a more efficient manner. If they're scattered throughout the landscape, then, it's, then it makes it a little bit more difficult, but uh, scattered around the landscape is, is, a, is it also an appropriate option, and it depends on how that silva pasture was established in itself. So the, the, the design should be considering both spacing within a, a tree shrub row and, and between the tree shrub row. Uh, you'll want to consider the initial cost. If the, the initial tree cost is high, then maybe you want to uh, look at uh, getting closer to the optimal density right away. But if the tree cost is relatively cheap, then certainly apply, uh, planting more trees than is necessary is, is a good way to, to hedge against uh, a failure during the first few years because some trees will survive. And so there, there are options that people have explored, whether it's a single or a double or triple row within the, that line of trees. It makes sense to have uh, multiple rows because then the, there's better weed control that, that you can have a higher tree density, greater shading of the, of the soil surface, less weed competition, and then consider thinning those uh, at, over time. So you can have individual widely spaced trees, uh, like uh, there are in Spain on the Dehesa, where there is, or in California, where there are uh, trees that are just uh, randomly placed on the landscape. They're, they they've developed, and so this can be an option where animals find comfort, but there there's plenty of forage in between. And also, you can consider uh, clustering or grouping trees. There's no magical way of uh, establishing a silver pasture. It's up to your creativity. So one approach is to, to plant those 250 trees per acre in forage alleys or uh, with forage alleys in mind. And that would be maybe um, this, this uh, diagram here on the land uh, on the right says, shows that it's 30 to 40 foot between these uh, tree lines. And I would, my personal experience on our uh, agroforestry experiment at uh, Goldsboro is that uh, those 40 foot lines uh, will be minimal. There's a lot of shading that's going to develop, especially with loblolly pine. They're, they're, they grow rapidly, and eventually the, there's just so much shade. Even in that 40-foot line, there's, there's a lot of shade that develops, and the forage doesn't produce as, as much. So consider maybe a little bit wider. Or we also have a, a spacing of 80-foot uh, in that experiment. 
So within the row, the tree spacing uh, may, may be dependent on some uh, federal or state subsidy program. If you're getting uh, some sort of subsidy program, then, then you'll have to follow those guidelines. It depends on your production or conservation objectives that are out there and whether you want to have wood production or other, some other production from those trees, or whether it's for, for fruits or nuts or for, for um, pulp wood. And there's that, that market for smaller diameter material, and so actually you, if you plant thick, then you can always consider that in 10 years you're going to come out and thin it, and you're going to have a, an income source in, in that 10 years for, for pulp wood. So between rows, you also have to consider the production versus the conservation benefits and whether it's going to be for wood production or, or, or nuts or, or pulp. There is that requirement for, for light for the forge. It's a very important requirement because if you're looking to produce, uh, an, uh, have a pasture with, with enough sufficient forage, you may have to make sure there's enough light that's, that's penetrating. And whether you are going to continuously graze or have a rotational stocking system, that, that will depend uh, that will kind of uh, determine it, what spacing that you have in, in those alleys. And uh, certainly with the farm equipment is important. It's more important in cropland, but it, it, it's also important if, if one is considering uh, cutting the, this grass for hay. So on the, on the Beer and Lanier farm, the Piney Woods farm managed by, owned by Beer and Lanier, uh, he's had some experiences and he wanted to share some of that with, with you all. And that's uh, that he uh, likes to have a 15-foot spacing in the row, uh, plant 10 foot apart between multiple rows in, in that uh, line of trees, and then at fi first thinning, which was about uh, 8 to 10 years, uh, take out every fourth row, and then a second thinning at uh, 10 to 15 years, take out every second row. And so there, the process is to take them out, harvest them for pulp, and then le leave more of the saw timber uh, with, with time. And the tree orientation should be considered. Uh, if you have only short rows or, or long rows, you have to consider about how, how equipment operators are going to get in there to harvest those trees. And that's, that's an important consideration to have in the beginning. There are uh, management issues with the trees that uh, one can, should consider pruning if you're looking for saw timber. Uh, to, to produce saw logs, uh, you, you need to have a, a sufficient bowl length. So the, the stem has to be usually in, in 12 foot intervals. So if you want to have a single 12 footer, then, then you can prune that way. And you can also go up you know, to larger increments as well. And so it will maybe depend on the site condition, but uh, certainly you need to consider uh, pruning at a, at a relatively early stage so that you encourage single stem growth if you're, if you're looking for uh, saw and timber. So at, at five to 10 years, one, one might consider a, a first pruning. Then there is the issue of uh, thinning. So if you start with 250 trees per acre, uh, certainly a thinning uh, will be needed because if you want to have some uh, forage under there, uh, you'll have to consider uh, is, if you have a solid stand, uh, what, how many rows you're going to take out, or if you're going to just leave uh, uh, target uh, trees per acre with uh, random, uh, random removal. So we, at tree thinning, uh, there's an uh, opportunity to, to of course, increase light. And then, there, then you have all this uh, dead wood uh, that's, that's out there. And the, the dead wood is, is not the issue, because uh, if it's pulp wood, you're removing the, the actual wood itself. But you have a lot of branches and leaves that are out there. So it may be um, uh, good to, to consider fire. But uh, you're, you're going to want to select those trees that are, that are the most uh, desirable for your next harvest, and, and keep those and, and take out everything else. So you're going to want to make sure that you have a, a, a processing deck uh, for delimbing and to, to um, uh, manage the site. And that's important to, to have, that, have that in mind, where that's going to be, and uh, possibly to have a fire afterwards to, to clear up the debris. And certainly this is not for the, the, the faint of heart. Uh, and so uh, adding a consultant to your operation is, is probably a very good thing. It'll, be, make, a wise, uh, it'll make a wise investment. So as far as the, the tree canopy, to, to actually look at the silvo pasture, because the silvo pasture is, is a livestock manager's goal, is, is to have forage for the livestock. So if there's too dense of a tree canopy, the, the forage isn't going to grow well. And so cool season forages have a ca capability of having less light than a warm season grass. So you're going to target about 40 to 60% tree canopy for a cool season forage, 
But for a warm season grass, you're going to maybe want to have even more light penetrating. So, penetrating. so you're going to have to want to shoot for 25 to 45% tree canopy to get enough light to penetrate so that the forage develops properly. And to de determine how much uh, light is penetrating, you can use uh, this uh, spherical densiometer. And it use, it's used to measure tree canopy. It's a reflector that is, is uh, going to uh, give, it's got a grid there. And you can see that the, the grid on the right, uh, you're going to record how many cells are occupied by, by tree canopy. And that will de determine how much light is penetrating at, at that point. And so you'll want to measure that at several places within your, your solo pasture so you know that you have enough light penetrating. For tree pruning, you want to make sure that you, you start early because uh, you, do, you don't want to have large branches that you're removing because those, those are subject to infection and then it deteriorates the wood itself. So you want to make sure that you start early. But you want to, don't want to start too early because you want the tree to develop and have a, a sufficient um, uh, leaf area so that it, it can actually uh, produce enough photosynthesis so that it grows properly. So delimbing is, is in, an important part early in the, in the process. So perhaps after five to 10 years, you, you'll want to start uh, uh, delimbing. Uh, late winter or early spring is best, certainly. But uh, there's, there's really, you, you can prune pretty much any time of the year, it, it's, it, depending on your labor force. But it's, it's, more, it's more palatable to the human uh, body to be doing this in the winter when you're working hard. Uh, rather than in the summer when it, uh, you can't respire so, so, or transpire so well. So your, your goal is to, to create an 18 to 30 foot knot free trunk. And th those knots will be there at the center when they're young, but uh, as the tree develops, those knots will not be there. They'll be on the interior wood. And you, you'll, you'll have a much qu higher quality wood product uh, if you can prune their, your trees early on. So you, and for some pine trees, they're, they're very capable, the loblolly is very capable of self-pruning itself uh, if, if there's enough shade. But if there are side branches, then you, you might have to consider pruning those. And uh, so you want to consider if, if pruning will pay, but in, in general, uh, if you have significant side branches, you're, you're gonna want to uh, prune, prune them. And uh, it will be much more important if you have uh, a hay operation because the hay operation is something that uh, will need to, you're going to need to have equipment get in there. And so early pruning is, is beneficial to make sure that the tractors can get uh, close enough to the trees. So for, for tree pruning, this is a, a, a system where you, you don't want to remove more than half of the crown ever. Uh, generally, you want to remove up to thir one third of the crown, which would be best. And the idea is that uh, you're gonna, you don't have to prune every year. Certainly, you can, you can uh, be pruning every five years, and that would be certainly sufficient. Uh, the proper pruning technique is, of course, to, to get close enough to the stem of the tree, but to leave the branch collar. Sometimes we, we tend to uh, uh, prune trees a little bit too close to the stem, and others uh, tend to pr uh, prune way too far away from the stem. And if you leave a, a a stem out there is hard for that tree to heal over. And so it's the, to getting that cut around the branch collar is, is really the ideal condition. You'll get uh, a very good prune and, and a healing that'll occur immediately thereafter. So switching to the forage component, uh, the proper forage selection and management are required to meet the nutritional needs of grazing livestock. You're gonna have landscapes that where silvo pasture is very ideal because of the difficulty with tr trying to grow any one particular forage or crop. And in this photo on the right, you can see that there's a wet spot in the landscape. This is, this is probably much more ideal for a silvo pasture in environment because it uh, often leads to uh, uh, degradation of the, of the forage crop or and in the previous case where we had crops, the, it uh, led to a degradation of, of the crop system. So you're going to consider whether you're going to want to graze more in the summer or in the fall, winter, or spring. In the, so the warm season or the cool season, the, this will determine the type of species. And you will want to know if you want to have a perennial system uh, or an annual system. There's the option of having grasses or, and or legumes. You can have a combination of the grass and legume or you can have one or the other. Legumes in our region tend not to persist over time, um, be, so having a grass component is really important. 
So you can consider when, when, if you do have a warm season species, such as um, Bermuda grass, that you can overseed with cool season species in the, in the spring and, um, so that there's grazing in the spring. And so you want to match the forage species or the mixture to the soil type and conditions. Uh, planting forages in a silvo pasture uh, could be difficult uh, when you are clearing woods and trying to get to forages established, so you, the site preparation is important. Uh, it may involve uh, disking and getting the, the, site, the soil established, but it does not have to involve that. And that, that's why you want to work with uh, those, uh, those consultants that can, can give you the best advice on, on each case. Uh, disking around trees is, is difficult. It's also dangerous for the, exist, the remaining trees. And so if you, one can establish, a, say, an annual grass, annual ryegrass under, under a, a timber establishment, that would be a good suitable first option and then broadcasting any other perennial species later on. You would also want to consider whether you add fertilizer and lime initially because getting the initial conditions uh, well in, will help establish that perennial system. If there are stumps uh, present, then mechanical tillage is going to be difficult, so you might have to remove those stumps, or you can work around them with broadcasting. And uh, so you can follow that broadcasting of annual seeds with, with uh, perennial seed mixtures uh, either at the same time or, or, or later. Having that uh, surface residue with the, an annual crop is often very beneficial to getting a perennial uh, species established. So a, a delayed planting of the perennial might be useful. There are many options for native warm season grasses. There's the switch grass, that's a, that's a possibility, big blue stem, Indian grass, eastern gamma grass. All four of these species we've planted at our uh, SAFS agroforestry system and in, in mixture. They have relatively low fertile, fertility requirements, certainly much less than 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year is needed in the first uh, uh, five years. But over time, they're, they're going to be self-fertilizing uh, because the, the, the cat, cattle or livestock are grazing, but they're returning that, those nutrients back to the landscape. So the fertility requirements are really quite, quite low for them. They're also resilient to drought and, and flooding conditions, and so this uh, is a consideration on, based on what, what the site condition is. Of course, there's a limited grazing season with these native warm season grasses, and so there is a possibility of overseeding them with, with uh, annuals but, uh, in, for winter uh, cool season grazing, but it is uh, an option to overcome some of the fescue toxic, toxicosis issues with wild-type uh, wild fescue, and so the, having some sort of uh, warm, native warm season grass on, on a farm is, is, can be a good option. There's, of course, the introduced warm season grasses, and the most typical one in, in North Carolina would be Bermuda grass. There are improved hybrids uh, that are mostly planted by sprigs, but to one can get seeded varieties as well, and these, these can be good options. Uh, the lower part, the southern part of the, of the coastal plain region has a possibility of, of introducing Bahia grass. It's also a warm season introduced species, and it could be a possibility under certain conditions. Both of these tolerate a wide range of soil conditions, and certainly with Bermuda grass, there's an option to, to have a much higher fertility requirement because the, the, the forage does respond to higher fertility. And so it, that is an option. If, if one has plentiful burr litter, or if we want to have a haying operation, the Bermuda grass might be a good option. Uh, the, the, with Bermuda grass, one should always consider uh, overseeding with annual grasses or le legumes in the winter because there's an option to, to greatly extend the, the, the forage capability in the, in the winter during the cool season months because Bermuda grass just does not grow during the, during the cool season. There's also an option of warm season annuals. Annuals can be a good option in, in a silvo pasture system, certainly in the, in the beginning years when uh, one might consider uh, cutting them for, for baleage or, or for hay. Uh, there are a variety of species available, uh, but it's going to require yearly seeding. Uh, that could be that it could be in, in, in rotation with annual crops as well, uh, these, these annual forages. But um, some of the most relevant species are sorghum sedan grass, pearl millet, crabgrass, or a multi-species mixture such as uh, Ray's Crazy Summer Mix. They're often broadcast, but they don't have to be broadcast, but you, you might want to consider some uh, light mechanical disturbance to get seed in, into the soil. Seed so, uh, soil contact is important for it to germinate, but uh, broadcasting oftentimes can work. 
and they are very high nutritive value, and so fertility requirements would be higher for, for annual uh, form season annuals, but they have higher uh, nutritive value for animals. The other option is, is cool season grasses, and certainly tall fescue in, in our, throughout North Carolina is, is very possible, more so in the western part of the state than the eastern part of the state, but uh, there's certainly tall fescue can, can persist somewhat even in the, in the far eastern part of the state. So it's, it's a very versatile forage, uh, and it's uh, readily, readily available. There are improved varieties uh, with uh, the novel endophyte. It's a, it's a key consideration to, to, to make, whether you want to spend a little bit more money on the novel endophyte versus the, the endophyte infected, the wild type endophyte infected. Uh, certainly there's, there's a whole other uh, story about the wild endophyte, but uh, there, there are ergot alkaloids present in that uh, wild endophyte that uh, can cause um, animal uh, gain issues and, and health disorders that one has to be careful about. And if, you're, if you don't have experience, certainly consult with, with the livestock grazing specialist or forage grazing speci forage, uh, specialist in the state. Kentucky 31 is the most common uh, type of tall fescue. It's persistent, it's nutrient efficient, uh, and it has this uh, uh, ergot alkaloids that, that cause negative uh, uh, effects on the animal. The novel endophytes are, are excellent. They, the seed costs are higher, uh, but it, it provides very good, excellent grazing conditions and it's a high quality forage. The cool season grasses tend to tolerate shade better than warm season grasses, so if there's a, a if you're more interested in the timber and having more trees per acre, then, then cool season grasses are important. It also depends on when you want to have uh, uh, your conditions for your livestock. If, if uh, livestock condition, shade during the summer is the biggest issue, then it might be that, that uh, one has to consider more of the, cool, the warm season grasses. But the cool season grasses offer uh, more extensive grazing during the cooler parts of the year and with lower light requirements. So there are also other varieties of cool season forages that are possible, and certainly more of them persist better in the cooler part of, uh, such as the Blue Ridge and the Piedmont uh, region. Cool season forages are, are, are best planted in mixtures of grasses and legumes, and there, certainly there are many options in the, in the Blue Ridge of, of orchard grass, rye grass, whether it's annual or perennial rye grass. Uh, there's uh, options for red clover, white clover, and crimson clover. Crimson clover being an annual and the others being uh, perennial species. So the livestock component, uh, you can have uh, cattle and sheep. Uh, that are, that, those are the primary ones in the, in the southeastern U.S. Animal performance can be enhanced due to heat, reduced heat stress. And uh, greater, there's greater forage availability because of the, the, uh, the, uh, the forage uh, being able to tolerate a little bit better the, 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 the drying conditions in the summer uh, with the shading of the trees and there's better nutritive value. There are different classes of livestock that one can consider and uh, many options are available. One just has to consider how those li livestock are managed. So enterprise choice, oftentimes uh, with it, on small acreages, poultry are considered in, in a silvopasture system. Poultry uh, require some shade too. They can uh, undergo heat stress. Uh, medium uh, size acreages, uh, there are small ruminants and, and the stalker cattle. Uh, getting into a uh, normal size farm, uh, average size farm in the, in the North Carolina, we're looking at stalker cattle and certainly cow-calf operations on, on operations that have uh, greater than 80 acres generally. Fencing is a con key consideration. One has to know how you're going to contain your animals. Permanent fencing around the property is important. Temporary fencing is, is certainly an option and very vi viable when, when looking at a rotational stocking system. You have to consider the future harvest of the trees, so you, you want to make sure that your fencing is, is appropriately placed and consider the grazing options, whether it's continuing, continuous grazing or rotational stocking. And you want to make sure where the water is going to be and how you can, you can get water access for the animals. So for the grazing management, there you, you want to consider your time and resources available. There are many producers that are, that are learning the, the intricacies and the arts of, of rotational stocking. Restricting access of livestock to smaller land units allows better forage utilization and less damage to the pasture. That recovery of the plant is very important. So you want to match the forage species to the appropriate season. And you want to consider what the animal requires and so that, that's, that you provide the animal with the proper forage. Key is don't overgraze. Certainly rest in the, in the forage stand is important. Cool season grasses, um, uh, you can... Um, um, 
have the cattle in when, they, when the, the grass is approximately 8 to 12 inches tall and then out when it's 3 to 4 inches tall, always having a little bit of leaf area left. And uh, warm season grasses, you can have a little bit uh, taller stand once you, once you go in and a little bit taller stand when you go out. Uh, the grasses, need, you need to leave uh, some leaves there for the photosynthetic factory to, to operate once you remove the animals. And certainly the overgrazing, uh, in, whether it's in open pasture or in a silvo pasture, can, if you're for, uh, cutting too short or grazing too short, you can kill the, the forages. So rotational stocking is just moving the animals uh, on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be the same time, but it's uh, matching the, the animals with the forage av available. So having a rest period of, of 30 days is, is quite uh, reasonable in a rotational stocking system. And uh, th that rest period is important to allow the, the plant to regenerate and to, to be prolific uh, in accessing water and nutrients. So to summarize, silvopasture pasture systems offer comfort and sustainability to livestock operations. The diversity of operation can be complicated, but offers risk avoidance, low cost operation, production and ecological benefits, and satisfaction in a sound conservation approach. Many options exist in how silver pastures can be established and managed. Learning from each other should be always encouraged, and that's, that's uh, we, we encourage you to ha ask questions. And certainly you can uh, contact any of these uh, co-authors on this presentation. They, their emails are here, and so I thank you for your attention. Thanks.